morning, everybody. We, so what I want to do today is talk about nuclear fission, not to be confused with fishing, that's different. Uh, tomorrow we'll talk about fusion. Right? So today we're going to talk about fission, we're going to talk about it in the context of power plants and energy. Uh, tomorrow, I might save tomorrow for both fusion and uh, bomb making 101. Okay. <laughs> I'm coming to so, class. Uh, we'll probably do that. Uh, I do apologize for the noise over here. I've got an aquarium pump running. The pod chamber, bubble chamber, is uh, not cooling down as fast as it is. So, let me get another. So, what I've got going up here is a demonstration so you can see radioactive decay is happening in real time. It's just that. Chamber is not being very hot. So I'm going to let this run. I'm going to keep checking it every once in a while during the lecture. So I'm spraying uh, ethanol in here right now. I need an ethanol fog to form. Let's see if we can. It feels cold enough, so I'm just wondering if it's just not wet enough. Let's see if we can get this working. If I can't get it working today, I will bring it in tomorrow. I have another chamber that I can try and set up and see if it works. All right. Jumping into it. Okay. Fission, the splitting of an atom by coaxing an unstable atom to split on demand. So this isn't like a standard radioactive decay, right? Alpha, beta, and gamma is a spontaneous, natural emission of uh, a radioactive particle and energy, whereas fission is induced. Now you can have natural fission, but you all are more likely going to have man-made fission. And what we're doing here is we're firing an energetic neutron into an already unstable nucleus. Again, unstable means you're higher than 86. And in that collision, right, you've taken something that's already just naturally unstable, and just pushed it way over the edge. So it's a little bit like you right before final loop. <laughs> right? It's just one little thing, right? And that's it, game over, right? The nucleus splits. Key thing is in that split, not only do you get energy, you also get excess neutrons. And those excess neutrons, now of course, you're never gonna have you know, you, the, your lump of plutonium and uranium just sitting there, you're never gonna have just one atom, right? These neutrons are going to go find atoms that are close by, cause them to split, and what you have is a chain reaction. Okay? So for every neutron that goes in, there's at least one that comes out, but anywhere between two or three, like the average is like 2.3. Okay? And so you're going to get this increase in the number of fission events that are taking place which means more and more neutrons, which means more and more energy. And the ability to control the rate at, with these, at which these fission reactions occur really is what sets apart a power plant from a bomb. Okay? In a bomb, we let this go as quickly as possible uh, and design it that way. And in a power plant, we want to never get to the point where this thing is running away uncontrolled. So uh, today we'll talk all about fission reactors and the engineering and everything that goes into this. So this is going. So we're going to talk about fission reactors. We're going to talk about Chernobyl. We're going to talk about Fukushima, uh, and then we are going to talk a little bit about um, how you calculate risk and how that dovetails into worldwide energy consumption. So we'll get there. You need a fuel. And the two fuels of choice are uranium-235. So if you look on the periodic table, you'll see uranium-238 is the chief uh, isotope that exists in nature. Uranium-235 needs to be extracted from naturally occurring. So if you go dig uranium out of the ground, you're going to get mostly uranium-238. Less than two-tenths of one percent of uranium-238 um, of a, of a sample of uranium is going to be uranium-235. So I 
don't know how much you follow the news. You probably don't when it comes to nuclear energy the way I do. Uh, but um, countries that get into hot water over their nuclear ambitions, like Iran, and Iraq, and uh, North Korea, okay, and some of these um, states that are looked down upon by the international community, they get in trouble not because they want to have nuclear power. That's not the issue. The issue is, is that they are creating their own nuclear fuels. The, in the case of Iran, it was that they were operating centrifuges to extract uranium-235 and uranium-238. That was banned by the international treaty. And I don't want to get into the politics of whether that's a good or bad thing, but generally the production of nuclear fuel is reserved to nine chief countries. Um, the proliferation of nuclear energy is actually something that is, until the last decade, has been actually encouraged. But plutonium-239, your other fuel, okay, if you look here on the periodic table, is bigger, uh, higher, two atomic numbers bigger than uranium, right? But also is in this sort of grayed out white thought. What does that mean? Not just unstable, anything above lead is unstable. Man-made, okay? In other words, we don't see plutonium occurring in nature. You can't go out and like extract plutonium ore, right? So plutonium needs to be made in something called a breeder reactor. This is a reactor that starts with uranium, but then is able to encourage the production of plutonium. Both uranium-235 and plutonium-239 are considered weapons grade materials. So not only do they power a power plant, they can also be turned into atomic weapons. So the, the fuel is costly. It's controlled and it can be misappropriated, right? Pretty easily. So those are some of the issues that surround it. Let, let's talk about parts of a reactor. This is not, don't go out and actually design the reactor this way, okay? <laughs> but these are the key parts of a reactor that you need, and I want you to be able to understand how these things work, okay? So you'll have something called a moderator. And just like a moderator at a debate, its job is to kind of make sure everything runs smoothly, including, and most importantly, the moderator's job is to make sure the energy that's being produced, that thermal energy that comes off of every fission event, is captured and transferred to the rest of the power plant in a safe way. You then have something called the control rods. Control rods do exactly what they say on the tin. They control the rate of the fission reactants, reactions that are taking place within the reactor. Control rods uh, typically consist of elements that are uh, we call them neutron sponges. These are elements that contain a lot of neutrons. They get unstable, but they don't get very unstable. So they're, they're radioactive, but it's not like uranium-235, which will just one neutron and boom, it's, it's out of here, right? It's going to split. Um, control rods, uh, I think, is uh, cesium is a popular one for control rods. Uh, it's, it's just a neutron sponge. It can absorb a lot of neutrons before it's, it itself becomes unstable. When your control rods are inserted all the way into the reactor, the reactor doesn't function. It just shuts down. There's, there's so, so many of these excess neutrons are being captured by the control rods that nothing, the fission really can't take place. And actually, it can get kind of difficult to restart the reactor once the control rods are pushed it all the way. Remove the control rods completely, and the fission reaction can run so fast and generate so much heat that you have the potential for an explosion. And I want to be clear here. It's not a nuclear explosion. There is not enough material in a reactor in order to cause a fission explosion, a nuclear explosion. The kinds of explosions that we saw at Chernobyl and Fukushima were all conventional explosions either steam explosions from pressure in the reactor vessel uh, exceeding the limits of the pressure vessel to hold it in, or in the case of Fukushima, we saw hydrogen explosions, and I'll get to that in a minute. 
But a key thing, right, is that these control rods are responsible for controlling the rate of reaction. They do that by soaking up neutrons like sponges, right? And uh, the moderator's job is to get the material, uh, get the heat out of the reactor and into safer places within the structure. Okay. Oh, it's working. All right. So, um, let's take this half of the room over here. Okay. What I want you to do is just come on up here. Okay. And take a look. Let's go right inside the chamber. We'll just get like 10 people and you'll just kind of have to get around it. Everybody take a turn and look inside there. Okay. And what you'll see, come on, get around. What you'll see are streaks in the fog. Okay, it'll it'll look like uh, a streak forms, and then there's a lot of sort of like cloud particles that fall off of it. Those streaks are being caused by radioactive particles that are being emitted off of the source that they have in there. So as the particle streaks through, it causes the um, ethyl alcohol molecules to condense, and you get to see that condensation. Yeah, it's kind of cool, isn't it? All right, go ahead and sit down, and we won't let anybody else up. Here no, okay, middle old panels, come on up. There's a point where you can see it. Don't be afraid of like, taking your turn to see it there. Still happening, right? Those are each one of those little strands, right? Is a radioactive particle that came off of the was it lead two ten? Yeah, lead two ten. So alpha and beta probably gamma go too fast and not very much. Uh, it just depends on how many ethyl alcohol fuels things are in the compact. All right. That's all the room coming up. Gather around. <laughs> yeah, feel free to take pictures, video, whatever. Again, each one of those streaks is a radioactive particle that is shooting off of that lead 210 and interacting with the ethyl alcohol molecules. They're like a fog inside there. You don't see the fog until the particle streaks through the fog. <laughs> right? It's just kind of mesmerizing, just staring at you. All right, so for Darren and anybody else, I will have this, I, I have to keep it going because I have to keep it cold. Uh, but um, if you want to come up afterwards and take a look at it, it'll, it'll still be working. I am going to wheel it out of the room because the pump sound is annoying. There we go. All right. Back to our regularly scheduled lecture. What you are looking at, okay, on the right hand side of this picture is the inside of a reactor. So the reactor here, uh, the lid, the top of the reactor has been taken off for servicing. Actually, to be truthful, what you're looking at is a research reactor. Actual like power reactors that are used for generating electricity tend to be like, they look a little bit cleaner, there aren't as many probes that are kind of sticking down inside of them, right? So this is a research reactor, but a, I've got another picture. Yeah, here's a, um, here's what a uh, functioning reactor looks like during servicing when they're swapping fuel rods in and out, okay? But uh, you'll see here that there is that telltale blue glow, okay? <laughs> Uh, that screams radiation, right? Yeah, it's never green. It's always blue, right? The whole got it wrong. Um, the, the, let's talk about that. So, so that blue light that you're seeing is called Chenkov radiation, okay? And it is the result of radioactive particles that are coming off of the fuel rods. 
those particles are moving faster than the speed of light in water. So, to be clear, right, the speed of light in a vacuum, you can never exceed. But since the speed of light slows down in every other material, if you move through that material faster than the speed of light can travel through the material, you, you will form the optical equivalent of a sonic boom. So what you're seeing is the light that's being given off, okay, by particles that are moving through water faster than light can move through water. And, and that blue glow happens, okay? Um, but anyway, okay, you can see places like they've taken rods out of the reactor here, okay? And uh, they're servicing them or doing other things, okay? There's some bubbles on the surface. There's always bubbles in the reactor. Um, so the, the design in the United States of America and most of the world is to have a moderator that is water. So you see, you see the water that's in there, right? Okay. There's a different design uh, that is used in Russia. There they use graphite and water, uh, graphite bricks and water, but we'll get to that in a bit. Um, so we have a water moderator. And then we have the, the fuel uh, rods and the control rods that are inside there. Um, in this picture, right, they're taking, so the, each of these is a cell, they'll take a fuel cell out, uh, and control rods get inserted, okay, in the holes right there. Control rods are a different assembly that comes down. On the uh, left-hand side here, you are seeing the very top, the lid, the outside of the lid, of the world's very first nuclear reactor that was ever constructed. Okay? Um, now, this reactor was a research reactor. Uh, it was commissioned during the Manhattan Project. So the Manhattan Project was the top secret uh, name of America's uh, atomic weapons program in World War II. Uh, about two years into the Manhattan Project, it was realized that after the war ended, there needed to be some application of this technology beyond being able to blow each other up. And so a scientist by the name of Enrico Fermi was tasked with taking what they had learned from the Atomic Weapons Project and figuring out how to reduce electrical energy, or at least how to get a reactor to even work. So the problem with many reactors is that they kind of self poison themselves, the, the, the radioactive particles that come off produce other gases and it messes with the moderator. And it's, it's a very technical engineering challenge to actually get a reactor to work, right? Um, so it's not like it's, it's not like the symptoms or it's real easy to mess up, okay? Uh, you, you really you kind of have to work at it to mess it up. Um, Enrico Fermi uh, was uh, an Italian and he was a Jew. And he had fled Italy during Mussolini's rise to power and the purges that the fascists were doing in Italy. He came to the United States and um, being a preeminent you know, physicist uh, and uh, in the emerging field of nuclear physics was tasked with, uh, well, he was part of the Manhattan Project and then he went off and did this. He was a pretty interesting guy. Um, but uh, he... Um, he and his team, okay, built up this reactor, which was basically, they called it the pile, because that's literally kind of what it was. It was a pile of, of graphite bricks, okay? Graphite is, uh, is a form of carbon. And um, in this picture, you can see Enrico Fermi. So this is an artist rendition, because no photographs were allowed during the okay, top secret type thing, right? Okay, so here's Enrico Fermi pushing, manually pulling control rods in and out of the reactor, right? Okay. Um, it wasn't going to blow up, don't worry, right? But like, this is like a research reactor, right? They didn't have any mechanisms for controlling any of this stuff. And um, this was the day, okay, that they first kind of turned on the reactor and, and got it running and seeing if it could sustain um, thermal energy output. Um, if you were to, if you were tasked with building the world's first nuclear reactor and you had to keep the project a secret, 
from even your allies. The British would not know about this project until about four days before Enrico Fermi would attempt to turn it on. That was like kind of how see, they, we were keeping it secret from the British, right? Okay, and They were a little bit miffed about that, but we made it up to America. Where would you build this thing? Like, again, you have to keep it like top secret, right? Underground? Underground? Yeah, because that, that doesn't sound like a bomb going later. <laughs> in the desert. Ooh, in the desert. OK, so that was the idea of the Manhattan Project, right? Manhattan Project, we got to go as far away from spies and prying eyes as possible. So no. where is that? Uh, northern New Mexico. <laughs> Nobody knows where northern New Mexico is, right? So overnight, right, in northern New Mexico, a little tiny town called Sandia, OK, in northern New Mexico, Overnight, like 5,000 people show up. Hey, hey, what are you doing here? Nothing. <laughs> what do you, you know, what did you go to school as? Well, I'm a mathematician. What did you go to school? I'm an engineer. What did you go to school as? Well, I'm a nuclear physicist. What did you go to school? Like, <laughs> a town appears basically overnight. Run by the army, <laughs> right? Staffed by, like, 17 Nobel Prize winners and a thousand scientists and engineers and all the clerical staff. <laughs> like, like, just, this is not how you do a secret program, right? Like, okay, I understand, like, you need space and all that kind of stuff. But, but yeah, that was, uh, the, the Germans knew something was up, right? <laughs> Obviously, right? But Enrico Fermi took a different tack. He was a professor at the University of Ch uh, Illinois at Chicago. And um, he's like, where am I going to build this thing? And so <laughs> the world's first nuclear reactor was built in a sub-basement <laughs> under the stadium. It was an unused racquetball court. They called them squash ball back then. I guess we call it pickleball now. But, um, and uh, <laughs> there was this unused basement. He's like, hey, can I use that? <laughs> what do you want to use it for? Uh, science. Right? <laughs> and, so, and so they had to deliver these graphite bricks, which had to be like made special and milled. So like to so it was not arouse suspicion over the period of like two months. They took like different delivery amounts of these graphite bricks, right? Like it was all kind of like this kind of weird cloak and dagger, but at a university it was kind of funny. Um, but anyway, they got the thing built. It worked, okay? This was, uh, uh, my note's up on here, um, but it was November, oh, what was it? I do have the note, where is it? Uh, well, December 2nd, 1942, okay? So on December 2nd, 1942, the world's first fission reactor went online. You don't need to remember that date, don't worry, okay? But... It would be it would be three more years before the war would be over, right? So this is kind of happening somewhat early in the development of the atomic weapons program, uh, and uh, when when uh, somebody here sent a coded message to uh, the president of the United States, who at the time was uh, Roosevelt, um, sent a message. The coded message was. The Italian navigator has landed in the New World and has found the natives friendly. Who was the Italian navigator? Enrico Fermi, right? Okay, what was the New World? New Mexico. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, power from a fission reaction, right? The nuclear age had begun. Okay? And the natives being friendly? It didn't blow up. Yeah. Not that it could have, but it, but it worked, right? Okay. A reactor, sort of in its design, consists of two key sides and an Achilles heel. So you, so you have, so, sorry, not, a, not just the reactor, but a power plant. How do you get electricity out of this thing, right? So great, we got fission reactions that are happening. It's giving off energy. It's giving off thermal energy. How, what do we do? So you take your reactor. Okay, and you do what your coffee maker does. What does your coffee maker do? It boils water. It's what it does, right? It happens to put that boiling water through coffee grounds and you say, oh, yay. 
but th th it's just a, it's a big water boiler. Okay, it, it boils water. The, the moderator being water. Okay, in contact with the nuclear fuels, picks up that energy, turns into steam, turns under steam under high pressure. So there's a lot of energy in there. And then that moderator gets pumped into something called a heat exchanger. And the heat exchanger's job is to allow thermal energy to flow between sides of the reactor, but not let the radioactive steam and water that's in the core of the reactor out. So the, 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 the moderator in the reactor is in a closed loop, and it stays inside of that closed loop, and it doesn't get out. Okay? In the heat exchanger, Thermal energy transitions into another vat of water, the clean side, okay, which again turns into steam. That steam gets pumped through a turbine. The turbine spins and generates electrical energy. The steam is captured from that turbine, condenses back into water, which gets sent back into the uh, heat exchanger to go around the circuit again. So in a nuclear reactor generating power, you have the radioactive side, and then you have the clean, sometimes called the dirty side and the clean side, but usually the radioactive side and the clean side. So what can go wrong? Everything. Well, no, not everything. Okay, really just two things. Contamination, radioactive contamination. The pumps. The pump. There are your Achilles heels. If the pump controlling the flow of moderator ceases to function, then you aren't going to be getting colder <laughs> moderator back into the reactor and the temperature of your moderator will increase, increase, increase until the point where your reactor, which is a closed pressure vessel, can no longer contain the pressure of that rising steam. If <laughs> your condenser pumps and the heat exchanger shut down and stop moving. Now, there's no way for the heat to get out of the reactor, right? And the heat will build up and build up and again, cause more and more steam, which cause more and more pressure. So, so in a reactor, the Achilles heel are these pumping systems that keep the moderator going and keep the heat exchanger going. Everything else, okay, actually isn't that much of a problem. Yes. The fuel is radioactive. Don't hold it in your hand. Like, there's like kind of basic things you don't do with uranium, right? Okay? One of them's holding it in your hand, right? Okay? So you got to be careful about all of that. But when it comes to the reactor operating in a safe way, if you can keep these pumps going, you're in good shape, okay? This didn't happen on the morning of April 26, 1986, outside of the Russian town of Kripkin, where the Chernobyl um, nuclear power plant reactor number, oh, I can't remember, number three, um, went critical. So there's a lot of history here I could share with you, but um, if you're really interested in sort of the timeline and what was going on, I, I, I've gone into a lot of detail. In this. It, it fascinates me. The, the short version is, is that Russia, the, the United Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR, too many S's in there, um, was in failure mode. Like, as a government, it was collapsing. Everybody saw the signs, it just kind of hadn't happened yet. And so through a series of bad decision making and on the, on the part of government authorities, uh, the crew at the Chernobyl plant was ordered to perform tests on the reactor, but years of mismanagement and not enough funding had left the safety systems of the reactor in a disabled state. I talked to one gentleman who was part of the investigation team that went, to, you know, came to BYU and he gave a talk. And afterwards, I ran up and I was like, you were at Chernobyl, like, tell me, like, help me. And he had stories that just would curl your hair. They found, um, they found one of the safety systems had been bypassed by a pair of jumper cables. Right? 
the, the, and this wasn't like the scientists' fault per se. The government wasn't funding them. And like, like we had a Russian exchange um, faculty come over. And I remember when he arrived. Uh, we were all kind of excited, right? This new exchange faculty coming in, all that kind of stuff. And he, he came off the, the plane, um, and it was pretty obvious that he was trying his best to, to look good. But the frayed stitching on his cuffs and kind of the patches in his pants told a very different story. And so as we got to know him, um, several of the faculty I found out later found out that for the Russian physicists at the time, so this is the late 1990s, this is post-collapse, right? Um, they didn't have really enough money to feed their families, let alone buy a clean white shirt. Right, so we all got together and went down and bought up uh, <laughs> bought up the local uh, <laughs> department store supply of white shirts and pants and shoes and that kind of stuff to give to him because the stories that he had of sort of mismanagement and how um, they didn't have money and there were just people would steal to be able to just feed their families and things like that it was very much that sort of kind of a apocalyptic story of a government in failure, right? Uh, we here in America complain about our government failing all the time, and we are nowhere close, right, to some of these failed regimes. Anyway, um, through a lot of mismanagement, a lot of um, lack of funding, and a lot of just supreme idiocy on the part of the government, um, there was a runaway event inside of the reactor. Reactors' thermal output spiked. They lost coolant in the form of water. And then as the water rushed back in, it immediately flashed the steam and the thing exploded. It exploded and started a fire. Okay? So the explosion itself actually wasn't that like big in terms of like bombs. It was the subsequent fire that really uh, did a lot of the plant in and is doing a lot of the damage that we see in this picture. Um, it's difficult to see, but I don't know if you can see this kind of faint white arc right here. Okay. That's the lid of the reactor. In the Soviet design, the lid was on the bottom. Okay? And so the fact that that's now on the top, right, speaks volumes as to what's transpired here. It was a steam explosion. It was um, as the firefighters pulled up to start putting out the fire about 2 o'clock in the morning, um, some of the firefighters would remark how they, they got out of their fire trucks and they saw these smoking bricks all over the ground and they couldn't, they're like, where did these come from? They knew that the structure was made of steel and concrete, not brick. What they didn't know is that the moderator was made of brick, right? It was graphite brick, okay? And what was on the ground everywhere was the inside of the reactor with fuel rods still inside, okay? Um, people in Pripyat who were kind of up late and kind of heard the explosion and came running out said that they looked towards the power plant and they basically saw the sun. Like they saw bright, searing light that they couldn't stare at, right? They were staring at the core of the reactor exposed to air, okay? Um, this was, an event unlike anything the world had ever seen in terms of a very, very bad day at a nuclear power plant. Um, this is one of the valve assemblies that sits underneath the power plant for scale. This crawl space right here is about uh, a little less than a meter high, like two and a half feet high. Okay, so you can get into it, but it's not very comfortable. So this is this is approximately like a 12 to 8, 14 inch sort of wide opening, right? I don't know if you can see the sort of spaghetti. It's coming out of it. That used to be molten graphite and fuel rods and control rods. Okay? What was going on inside of this reactor now that it had lost its moderator, the fuel rods were unchecked and the thermal energy was building up to the point where it became molten uranium, okay? molten lava. Self-sustaining, okay? not cooling off, 
So just getting hotter and hotter and hotter, and then melting things around it, all the while giving off radiation, okay? And then that molten sludge started to flow through the plumbing of the reactor. And everywhere it could find it out, it did, right? Melting through connections, melting through wells, melting through everything. Um, in the business, it's called the China Syndrome, okay? Because that molten ball of sludge, which is heating itself under the fission reactions, uh, is basically on its way to China, right? It's just, it's just going to melt its way, okay? Until it finally kind of spreads out enough that your thermal neutrons can start escaping somewhere else besides staying inside of the pole. Again, not exploding. The explosion was a steam explosion. The explosion, the steam was highly radioactive. The, the graphite bricks that exploded and released dust spread radiation everywhere. The radiation came from the steam explosion, okay? And then settled in as fallout all around. Here's a map of tracing the fallout of the Chernobyl disaster. It uh, speaks volumes about how far some of this radiation went and what the springtime weather patterns are like in continental Europe and even the United States. You can see how Here's where the reactor was, right? You can see, <laughs> what? Right? Okay, made it all the way to the UK around the circumpolar vortex, or whatever it is they call that weather system up there at high latitudes. There are still areas in Scotland where it is illegal to butcher sheep for human consumption because the radioactivity in the sheep is too high. How many years are we away from, was it 30 something years since this, 35. right? Like it, it, it's crazy, right? The radiation persists. And like I told you before, every reactor has its own fingerprint. And so we know exactly right, that this radiation came from Chernobyl. Um, on, a, on a side note here, take, take note, okay? of the location of the Chernobyl reactor. Where does it sit? In Ukraine, right next to Belarus and the, and I've already shared with you how radioactive the exclusion zone is around Chernobyl, the place where people were ostensibly not allowed to go. Um, things are so radioactive around Chernobyl that in the subsequent cleanup and mitigation of the site, okay, it was decided that basically the only thing they could do was to build a sarcophagus, that's the name of it, around the plant. A sarcophagus is a fancy word for like a tomb, okay, a place where you put coffins kind of thing. And uh, so what you're seeing here is the construction of the sarcophagus. It was a um, steel reinforced concrete uh, structure with walls about a meter thick. Um, everything you see in this picture came to Chernobyl and had to stay at Chernobyl. The cranes, the bulldozers, the cars, um, anything that spent time on site doing anything had to be left on site because it became so radioactive it was considered radioactive waste. The workers were allowed to leave because oh, they're very we are Did they have any kind of protection? <laughs> okay, so did they have any kind of protection? Initially, no, the firefighters didn't even know what was going on, right? And so they started coming down with radiation sickness, so they went to the local hospital. That hospital, there's a room in the basement where they, where the, so the doctors and nurses realized what was going on. Right away, they're like, oh my gosh. Stripped down. So the, so the firefighters' uniforms were thrown into a room. That room is very radioactive, like, to this day. Still? Oh, yeah. Chernobyl will be this radioactive for the next 60,000 years. Okay? That's how long it's going to take for the half-lives of some of these things to get to a point where it would be safe to, like, no longer monitor or check. Now, 
There's a lot of parts in the exclusion zone that are perfectly safe. You walk along the roads and things like that. They've been swept. They've been cleaned. The, the radiation's been pulled, pushed off of them. You step off the road, though, and the radiation goes up. It's in the dust. It's in the soil. It's everywhere. Right? So you can kind of clean up. So there were, there were places where they just dug out like the top meter of earth okay, and piled it up. Okay? Um, as radioactive dirt, radioactive waste. There's a part near Chernobyl called the Red Forest. It's called the Red Forest because all the trees are dead. Okay? Look, when they died, they turned this just bright kind of red color uh, as the needles just died off but still had all of their like, chlorophyll chemicals. So kind of like imagine a pine tree like in the fall. Pine trees are, are evergreen, but imagine if they could change their colors, like doing that. Okay? Um, so that, that's where the cloud of radioactive steam went and uh, killed that forest. Well, they started dumping a lot of, of this topsoil and other things in the Red Forest. It was the most contaminated place, so bring all the contaminated stuff together, right? Let's go to camp. Just this week, there was an article, um, uh, doctors in um, Ukraine were treating captured Russian soldiers who had severe radiation poisoning, and they found out from the Russian soldiers that um, they had been ordered to dig um, artillery reinforcement bunkers in the Red Forest. The sarcophagus didn't last. It only took about 12 years before they discovered that some of those walls that they poured at one meter thick had been eroded down to 10 centimeters by the intense radiation from Okay, They found this out. You, you don't walk into a building like that. I just want to say that on <laughs> the surface, right? Uh, approximately 20, 22 deaths were attributed as a direct result of like the fire, subsequent like mitigation efforts so like people that initially ran in to try and figure out what was going on um and uh the helicopter pilot and photographer that took the picture of the plant from above they both died um from the radiation exposure coming off of the plant and, and so the russian army was called out after the firefighters were like we're done here we're not doing this anymore um and the and the russian army soldiers were told to um because at the time, Russia was in control of Ukraine government. This area. Um, they handed them a shovel. They said, run up to the edge of the fire, uh, shovel for 40 seconds, and then run back and stay here for two hours. And then run up, shovel for 40 seconds, right? That was the Russian army's method of trying to mitigate um, radiation exposure. Um, people in Pripyat were told they were evacuated, right? They said, for safety, we'll, we'll have you back here in a couple of days. Just leave everything. We'll be back in a couple of days. Those people never went home. Um, it's, like I said, will continue to be an exclusion zone for 60,000 years, right? Or a place where you shouldn't go. So they found out that the sarcophagus was failing because NASA volunteered one of their rovers that they used for Mars. They had like a backup prototype that we're using anymore, right? You want to use these, <laughs> these, these rovers are designed to be able to go from the Earth to Mars while constantly being hit by the radiation from the sun. No filter, no weight, right? No shielding, right? These are hardened pieces of equipment, right? Against radiation, the rover lasted 20 minutes. So, another structure was proposed, okay? And uh, here you can see that they're taking the idea of like a bridge and sort of like building bridge trusses. But this structure, unlike the sarcophagus that preceded it, is on rails. This one can actually roll back and forth. And as far as I know, I, didn't, I forgot to check this morning, but last year when I checked, it is the largest movable structure on the surface of the planet. Okay? Its, it's whole job, okay, they're here they're still building it, <laughs> is to roll <laughs> over the top, okay? of the reactor, kind of all, well, three quarters of the way over the reactor, and then sort of seal itself 
around there. So, so it's, it's not like they kind of turn, you know, move it back and forth. But what they wanted the ability to do, unlike the first sarcophagus, they wanted the ability to be able to take the lid off, right, and go back in and do stuff and then maybe put it back, right? They wanted that flexibility. It also has equipment inside of it to help with the decommissioning of the reactor inside uh, to kind of help start cleaning up. Um, the most radioactive parts that exist. Here it is in October 2017 when it was uh, fully rolled over. This is from the opposite side from the other picture that you saw. Okay, And here they're starting to seal up the edges right around uh, the reactor building. So this is this structure is assumed to be good for the next 80 to 100 years after which with continued servicing and maintenance after which it will need to be replaced with something else every 50 to 100 years for the next 60,000 years. Uh, this is a coffee shop in Pripyat, right? This is before the explosion, okay? Um, kind of a typical Russian town and built in the you know, late 70s, making a bunker. Right, because you know the Americans are going to blow us up. That kind of stuff. You haven't seen that architecture ever, right? Has anybody walked around campus? A lot of these buildings were built in the '60s, and they were built as cubes for a reason. Okay, um, so there are some areas on campus where there are there are bomb shelters. They're kind of closed up and that kind of stuff, but, but they are there. Okay? Um, my community college, we actually that the signs were still up bomb shelter in some of the buildings. It's pretty funny. Um, so 10 years later, this is that same cafe, right? And you can see how nature is taking over. Um, here it is in 2006. Okay. And uh, I, I could give you more recent pictures, but they all tell the same story. Okay. Nature wins. For all the horribleness of Chernobyl, okay, there are some silver linings. Chernobyl gave us, for the first time, the ability to see what happens to an ecosystem when human beings are removed. Granted, a lot of background radiation, but an animal, an insect, and plant population Typically, when there are birth defects or mutations or that sort of stuff, those organisms simply die. Right? They don't make it. And the organisms that do survive are the ones that have gotten the kinds of mutations that are beneficial to that environment. Herds of deer blossom. Trees and plants took over. Gray wolves, thought to be extinct in this part of the Ural Mountains, came back without humans ever reintroducing them because they had enough deer population and their food source was present. It is an absolute bonanza of an ecosystem roaring back to life once you take the humans out of the picture. Um, <laughs> it was asked before Chernobyl, it was estimated that it would take like a thousand years for the evidence of civilization to be consumed by nature. Uh -uh. In a matter of decades, you can basically hide it. There are parts of Pripyat, you're walking down the street, you're walking through a forest, and you're like, this is a weirdly straight forest. What you're walking down is a road where the trees have all grown up through the asphalt. Okay. You walk through the forest and the road ends and all of a sudden you're standing at bleachers at the soccer stadium. You couldn't see it five feet from your nose. Absolutely incredible. This is Fukushima Daiichi in Japan uh, before the earthquake uh, that took place. Uh, the earthquake was a 9.3 magnitude earthquake. Um, the thing you need to understand about Japan, their nation is built on a volcanic island, basically, okay? And um, it, 
volcanic at fault, which is a, a chain of, of basically volcanoes, right? So they know volcanoes, they know earthquakes. If there is a people on this planet that is most prepared for an earthquake, it is the people of Japan. Like monthly drills on what to do in the event of a tsunami, right? So in the earthquake and the su subsequent tsunami that struck Japan, it is absolutely astounding that only tens of thousands of people died. This is, this is a country that has the largest concentration like metropolis area in the world, right? And yet they can measure the number of deaths directly attributed to the earthquake and tsunami in like 20 something thousand. It's, it's like, it's a really, really low number. Compare and contrast with about four years previous to this, the tsunami that hit Indonesia, where approximately 300,000 people died from an earthquake that was a smaller magnitude earthquake. It's, it's a difference in preparation, right? Uh, and access to technology and a whole lot of other things. But this is Fukushima Daiichi. You can see that there are four reactors at this plant right here. And um, all of them were more or less ground zero for the tsunami that struck. This is a Google satellite, Google Maps view, okay, of the top of the plant. Here's your four reactors. You can see here that there's like a harbor that's been built. Reactors need to be near bodies of water. You need to get your, your moderator from somewhere, right, okay? And so oceans are a great place to get it from. There's a lot of water, right? You can use it. You can safely discharge your heat exchanger water if you need to refresh, all that kind of stuff. And you need a place to be able to bring the fuel in and take the waste out, okay? Um, and ship the waste. In the case of Japan, back in the time, they were shipping it to France. Yes, radioactive waste on the high seas. Imagine being a pirate. Oh, we got you. <laughs> so this seawall right here, okay, the seawall that's built along here, that whole structure was designed for a 15 meter tsunami. So that's a 45 to 50 foot wave of water coming in. The tsunami that hit, okay, was about 50 feet, okay? The problem was is that the earthquake had dropped the entire coastline in a matter of 40 seconds, one meter. So now their seawall, which could handle a 15 meter tsunami, was only 14 meters above sea level. The tsunami swept in, flooded the plant, flooded the diesel generators that were acting as the backups for those pumps that I told you about. And once the pumps failed, that was it. It was only a matter of time before you would have this. So I remember watching the coverage of this and I remember the news anchors talking about, there's been an event at the Fukushima Daiichi plant and oh my gosh, the reactor has exploded. If the reactor had gone through a nuclear explosion, this camera would not be there to continue recording it, right? Also, as I've already taught you, there isn't enough material in a reactor to do that kind of explosion. What this very obviously is, and you can see it right here, this is a chemical explosion, okay? This ball of fire down here screams one thing to me because I know how reactors work and what's going on when the reactor shuts down. That's a hydrogen explosion. When the moderator stops flowing, okay, there's other sort of safety mechanisms that can keep sort of a minimal flow going. So uh, more modern designs use a gravity fed, fed thing where they can like feed cool water for like seven days, which is enough time to get like things hooked up and the, the pumps going again. Uh, but anyway, uh, Fukushima was an older style, didn't have that kind of thing. But you could just kind of do these tricks to kind of gravity feed and pressure manage and all that kind of stuff. But what happens is when water is in contact with these radioactive substances for too long, it starts to disassociate. It disassociates into hydrogen and oxygen. And uh, there's some other things that get made, but they're not as important. So, so you have this gas starting to build up. 
And, and they were relieving gas. Like they knew this was a problem. They weren't idiots, right? They knew this was a problem. They're trying to, they're letting hydrogen gas out. But with all of the damage, right, to the plant, and there was a spark somewhere, and you had the hydrogen explosion. They were, they were actively trying, they were like shooting seawater directly on the top of the plant, which is a death sentence, like, like salt water coming down on a lot of these parts. Is, is no good. They can use salt water as moderator, but they have to filter all the salt out and they have to make it really pure. Sending seawater onto the top of the plant was, the Japanese knew that this was not going to be recoverable. They were just simply trying to save their nation, right? Um, but the subsequent fires, ravaging the structure, all that kind of stuff, it was, it was a terrible event that happened to a great nation who was ready that's, not, that's kind of the mind-bending part of all of this. Of all the countries in the world, the Japanese were ready. The plant did exactly what it should have done in that earthquake. As soon as the earthquake waves were there, before people even realized the ground was moving, these plants were already undergoing automated shutdown to put themselves into a state where as long as cooling water was still flowing, they weren't going to be producing electricity, and therefore the, the reactors weren't going to be at any kind of problem state. It was when that tsunami hit, 40 minutes later, that these plants really suffered. The, when you have a basement that is supposed to be able to withstand like you know, a 50-foot tsunami, and your basement's three stories, deep and it completely fills that's not how do you how do you plan against that i mean obviously we'll put the generators on the roof harder than you think these are big things right so this was a people who were ready and yet it still bit them not nearly as bad as chernobyl people living around fukushima have now been coming back like there's a stigma to it but it's open like, people can come back. It's safe for people to come back. Unlike the people who live around Chernobyl, you don't have to carry a radiation counter around with you in order to check and make sure your potatoes and carrots are too radioactive to eat. It's bizarre. There's these pictures out of the Chernobyl exclusion zone where native peoples in these areas, like, when I say native peoples, it's not like Native Americans. Right? I'm talking like, like these, these, these ancient Russian peoples, right? The, 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 the kind of stereotypical sort of Russian grandma with her headscarf on, right? And, right? She's sitting there, building with no electricity by choice. Like these people choose to live simply on these farms, right? And they didn't want to get out, and so they came back and started farming again within the exclusion zone, right? <laughs> and they'll be sitting there, and there's these pictures, shopping her carrots, Pulls open the drawer, pulls out a radiation counter, puts it back, keeps going. No running water, no electricity, radiation counter in the knife drawer. Uh, it just, uh, people are amazing. People are absolutely amazing. All right. Um, I'm going to hit pause on the recording here. So if you're... If you're not here right now, you're going to miss that. So you're just going to have to wonder. I don't know if you're really here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a story.